Hey guys. Um, so sorry we're not able to see each other face to face today, but if you are watching this video, then you are in the correct place. Uh, so this is your pre-recorded math lesson for, what is today? Uh, Thursday, January uh, 13th. So all I need you to do for math today is just watch this video. Uh, make sure that you have your math NC check-in number two study guide. So if you were at school on Wednesday, then this was given to you. And I told you guys to make sure you pack it in your book bag and take it home with you because of all the craziness this week. Um, if you are not at school on Wednesday, then you are not given a copy of this. However, uh, for some of you, I have emailed it to your parents. Um, so your parents can always reach out and ask me for it. I can email it to them and then they can print it off and you'll have it that way. Uh, but worst case scenario, if you are not able to have an actual copy of this in front of you, then what you need to do for today's video as well as tomorrow's is pull out some notebook paper Paper, um, and then you're still going to work out the problems using your notebook paper. And then whenever you come back to school, we'll just kind of staple everything, attach it, and we'll get you all organized and ready to go. Uh, so either way, guys, you are going to be held accountable for making sure that you are watching the videos for math for Thursday and Friday, uh, showing all of your work and all that good stuff. This is a review of everything we learned for the second nine weeks of school. And this is also going to be your study guide for helping you guys be successful on that second math check-in. As of right now, the check-in for math is still happening on January 25th. I have asked if that date is going to change because of everything this week. And as of right now, we still don't know. So let's just plan right now that the check-in is on January 25th. And if that happens to change, then I will let you know. All right, guys, so I have this out in front of you or some notebook paper either way. And we're gonna start right here on question number six. Now, if you are in Ms. Towery's homeroom, uh, we've actually already done question number six. If you are in Ms. Turner's homeroom, we did not get to question number six. Uh, so either way, guys, just sit tight, stay with me here, and we are going to start with question number six. All right, so question number six says, which choice is shaded to represent the value of the expression one half divided by three? So what we have here is we are dividing a unit fraction by a whole number. So let's take a moment and remember what these numbers in the division problem actually mean. So we're starting right here with one half. Any division problem, the very first number is always going to be your total. So jot that down. Okay, you know the rule. If I write it, you write it. I will be checking. Okay, so you guys don't want to have to go back and rewatch this all over again, right? So let's just do it right the first time. Okay, all right. So we know the first number is our total. Now, what is that second number? That second number in this case, this is going to be the number of parts. This is going to be the number of parts. So what we have in one half divided by three, our total is one half, and we're going to take our one half total, and we're going to divide it into three equal size parts. So then our answer should be showing us what the size of the part is going to be that we are creating. So here, if you look at A, B, C, and D, you have your models to choose from, but I'll also tell you guys there are a couple of of hints that we can kind of use to help us very easily answer this question. So one of the first hints that we should use is this. So if you recall, we talked about this during the second nine weeks. Look at the division problem again. One half is a unit fraction and we are dividing that by a whole number. So you probably remember this, write this with me. Anytime you have a unit fraction, so UF for unit fraction, and you are dividing that by a whole number, W hashtag for whole number, what is your answer going to be? Is your answer going to be a unit fraction or is it going to be a whole number? If you said unit fraction, then you are correct. Your answer is going to be a unit fraction. So we already know that whenever we do one half divided by three, our answer is going to be a unit fraction. So we should be looking for the model that gives us a unit fraction. So there's one piece of information 
that we know and we can use to help us answer this question. Another thing that we can use to help us answer this question would be KFC. So if you go back and look at the question, it says, which choice is shaded to represent the value of the expression? Well, value, that just means the answer. That just means the answer to the division problem. So another way to answer question number six is to actually solve one half divided by three using KFC, get the value, and then whatever answer we get to one half divided by three, we're going to pick the model that shows us that same answer. So let's go ahead and do that. So we're going to do one half divided by three. So you should be writing that down. One half divided by three, and we're going to solve this using KFC. Why are we using KFC? Because that is the strategy that we use when we are dividing with a fraction. So over here off to the side or at the very top, I'm going to write KFC, and then we're going to go through our KFC steps. All right, so letter K, that tells us that we're going to keep the first number the same. So one half is going to remain one half. We keep it the same, we leave it alone. And there goes the letter K. Now we're going to move on to the letter F. The letter F tells us that we're going to flip the second number. The second number is three. However, you need to remember three is a whole number. Every whole number has a denominator of one. So three is actually the same thing as three over one. Now what we're going to do is flip three over one. So three, when you flip it, you get one third. There goes the letter F. And now we're gonna move on to the letter C. We're gonna change the division sign to a multiplication sign. So what we have here is one half times one third. We multiply straight across. One times one is one. Two times three is six. So the value or the answer to this division problem is one sixth. Now what you need to do is go find which one of these models shows us a model of one sixth. Hopefully you guys picked letter B. Letter B is the correct answer. So in letter B, what we see is one part is shaded in out of the six parts that we have all together. So that gives us one out of six, which is one sixth. When I solve one half divided by three, I get one sixth. So see the model and the value to the expression are the same. So we know that B is going to be the correct answer. Okay. All right, let's go ahead and move on to number seven. All right, so number seven, we've got a word problem here, and you guys can already see in this word problem, you are given a box. The purpose of this box is for us to type in our answer. Now, on the first check-in, you guys did have to type in your answers, but it wasn't anything super crazy because your answers were just like whole numbers. Now, on this check-in, you're going to have answers to type in that are decimals and also fractions, so you need to pay very close attention to how you're typing in your answer. Okay, so we're going to start with number seven. Number seven says Madeline has six chapters to read over four days. How many chapters will she need to read each day? So there's a couple of different things I see here to kind of help me kind of break apart the word problem. So the first thing I see are these words right here read over. And we actually talked about this in class. You have a, a chart in your math notebook in the second nine week section where we wrote out a lot of different division words. And we wrote words like share equally, split equally, divide equally, split over, divide over. Well, this could actually fall into that same category. If we're reading something over several period of days, that means you're taking a total. You're taking the total amount of something that you need to do or something that you want to read, and you're, you're splitting it over the time that you have to get that done. So whenever it says read over, I want you to think of division. Okay, so what is it that we are dividing? Am I dividing six chapters over four days or am I splitting up my four days over six chapters? I would hope that by now you guys would already understand a couple of things. Like number one, what are the things that we never, ever, ever, ever split? We're going to write those down together because the more you write it, the more likely you are 
to remember it. So let's write this down together. What are the things that we never split? So we never split days, and it doesn't matter what order you write them in. We never split people. And what else do we never split? We never split animals, right? So if we never split days, people, or animals, then we know that if my word problem says days, or I have people, or I have animals, then that should be the second number of my division problem. So let's look right here. What do I have in my word problem? I have chapters and I have days. I know that I never split days, so that's one reason why days, the four days, is going to be the last number of my division problem. But also, I hope you guys would understand, it, it doesn't make sense to say that I've got four days, like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and I'm going to split those days up into chapters. Why would you need to split your days up into chapters? That's not even how you split a day up, right? Days are split up by, you know, hours and minutes and seconds and things like that. So that wouldn't even make any sense. What actually makes sense here is to say I've got six chapters of a book left to read and I want to get this book done in four days. So I'm going to take my six chapters. I'm going to read a little bit every single day for four days and at the end of those four days i will have read all six chapters that's what actually makes more sense here so what that means is this six chapters right here that's my total six chapters is the total amount of chapters that i have left to read in my book and i want to try to split that up over four days so my division problem should look like this it should be six divided by four. So write that with me. Six divided by four. So I'm taking my six chapters and I'm splitting them up over four days. So now I've got a couple different division strategies that I can use to give me my answer. I've got N divided by D and I've also got KFC. Which one are we going to use here? N divided by D or KFC? If you said KFC, that would be incorrect. We're going to use KFC only when we're dividing with a fraction. These are not fractions. These are whole numbers. So instead, we should be doing N divided by D. That's kind of like our formula here, N divided by D. And this formula actually gives us our answer to the division problem in the form of a fraction. So the first number is going to be my numerator. So six, the second number is going to be my denominator, that's four, and I end up with my answer being six-fourths. And of course, you guys already know, six-fourths is an improper fraction. Normally, what we would want to do is go ahead and convert that into a mixed number. However, if we look at these directions carefully for how we need to type in our answer, we are not going to make this a mixed number. I say that again, we are not going to make that a mixed number. Go look at your directions here with me, and I'm going to start right here where it says answers. Answers that are mixed numbers must be entered as an improper fraction or a decimal. So what does that mean? What that means is that if your answer to question number seven is a mixed number, you cannot put in a mixed number. That is a no-no. The computer does not know how to read a mixed number. So instead, it says you must enter your answer as an improper fraction or a decimal. Well, look at six-fourths. Six-fourths is our answer. And since that is already an improper fraction, we're going to leave it alone. We can type in an improper fraction, and 6 fourths is an improper fraction. So we're going to type into the box 6 fourths. We do that by typing a 6, so write in a 6. Then we'll do a slash. If you don't know how to do a slash on your computer, I can show you all that next week before the check-ins. And then our denominator is 4. So six slash four. And literally, guys, that's it. That's all you have to type in. If your answer is six fourths, then do six slash four and you're done. You've answered question number seven. Pretty easy, right? 
All right, let's go ahead and move on. Remember guys, if I'm moving too fast, you can always pause the video, okay? All right, so let's go find question number eight. So now we're gonna start talking about some decimals here. All right, so question number eight, it says, a group of four friends recorded how fast they could run 100 meters. So here you got all of our friends, Talon, Lane, Camden, Curry. What up, fellas? All right, and then you can also see how fast they were. Now, I know a lot of you are probably thinking, oh, fast. We're talking about speed. That means we need to remember how the rules change with decimals. Remember, we talked about how the faster you run, the smaller your decimal, or the slower you run, the bigger your decimal. So if you were thinking that in your head, it's not that you're wrong. It's just that that's not what we're doing for question number eight here. Because if we look at the question, it just says, what was the total time of all four runners? So now you're probably thinking, well, that seems too easy. It is that easy. This is a very simple question. You have all four friends, you have their times right here, and it's just asking you what was the total time of all the runners. So I take the time of all four of my runners, I combine them, and then that will give me my total. So what do I need to do here? Hopefully you're saying that we need to add because addition would be the right thing to do. We're just adding all four decimals together. That's it. So we're going to start with Talon and I'm going to do it right here where I've got some room. Talon was 14.85 seconds. Lane was 14.09 seconds. Make sure you guys write down the numbers correctly. I've caught some of you in class saying, oh, why did I get the wrong answer? And it's because you wrote the number down wrong, right? And also make sure you're lining up the decimal points because we're adding decimals together. All right, so now we're on Camden. He ran in 15.36 seconds. And then we've got Curry at 13.45 seconds. We want to know the total time of all four runners, so all we have to do is add the four numbers together. What I'm going to go ahead and do first is bring down my decimal, because guys, look, you have to type in your answer. What happens if you have the right digits, but you forget to type in a decimal? Well, it's going to say that you got the wrong answer because you did, okay? You have to remember to insert your decimal. All right, so we're going to start with all the digits in the hundreds place right here. We're going to add them together. Uh, one thing I noticed is that I have five and five. That makes 10. And then I've got nine and six. So nine plus six, if you can't do that in your head, do it on your fingers. Nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. We get 15. So you're essentially doing 10 plus 15, which is the same thing as 25. So five, regroup a two above the eight. Now, I notice here that 8 plus 2 is 10, 10 plus 3 is 13, and 13 plus 4 is 17. So 7, regroup a 1 above the 4, and now here I've got 4 plus 4, which is 8. Uh, let's see, 8 plus 1 is 9, 9 plus 3 is what, 9, 10, 11, 12, and then 12 plus 5 is 17. So seven, regroup a one. And now in the tens place, just add all the ones together. One, two, three, four, five. So your answer should be 57 and 75 hundredths. So then we just write that in the box. Five, seven, decimal point. Please do not forget your decimal point. If you do, it's gonna be really sad on the check-in because you will have done everything perfectly, but you'll get the wrong answer because you didn't put your decimal in, okay? All right, guys, let's go ahead and move on down to number nine. Number nine, Kaylee bought 13.27 pounds of candy. And Kaylee, you already know why I picked your name for this word problem. That is a candy-loving girl, boys and girls. All right, so number nine, Kaylee bought 13.27 pounds of candy. 4.88 pounds were gummy bears. The rest were M&Ms. We want to know how many pounds of M&Ms did Kaylee buy? All right, so a couple of things I noticed in this were a problem. I noticed that I have the total. What is my total in this were problem? Can you go ahead and mark it? What is our total? 
The total is 13.27. That is how many pounds of candy she bought in all. Doesn't matter if it was gummy bears or M&Ms. If you take the gummy bears that she bought and the M&Ms that she bought and you put them together, that, that's her total. That's how many pounds of candy she has in all. So now what I also know is that some of the candy was gummy bears. 4.88 pounds were gummy bears, but the rest were M&Ms. So we need to know how many pounds were M&Ms. So we know we can't go over 13.27. That is your total. So the number you type into the box cannot be bigger than 13.27. There's no way she has more than 13.27 pounds of M&Ms when that's how much candy she has all together, right? So what should we be doing here? We're going to take our total, which is 13.27. That's how many pounds of candy she has all together. And what we need to do here is actually subtract the amount that was gummy bears because then the number we get shows that the rest were M&Ms. That's going to show that whatever number you have left over represents the amount of M&Ms that she had. So 13.27 minus 4. 0.88, and you should be lining the decimals up perfectly on top of one another, okay? Now, before I subtract, what I'm going to actually go ahead and do is bring my decimal straight down, okay? And then we're going to go from there. So, 7 minus 8. Can I do that? No. So, cross off the 7. 2 minus 8. Can I do that? No. So, cross off the 2. 3 minus 4. Can I do that? No. One minus an imaginary zero as a placeholder here. Can I do that? Yes, I can. So the one becomes a zero. And then y'all should know what to do from here. The three becomes a 13. The 13 becomes a 12. This two becomes a 12. 12 becomes an 11, and this 7 becomes a 17. We've been over this a bunch of times in class on why we're making the numbers look the way that we are, okay? And then we're going to subtract from here. So 17 minus 8. So you can always count on if you need to. So 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. That would be 9. Okay, then we're going to do 11 minus 8. Again, you can count on if you need to. 8, 9, 10, 11, that gives you 3. Uh, 12 minus 4 gives us 8. And then 0 minus 0, of course, they cancel each other out. That would be nothing. So this is our final answer. This is going to represent that the rest of her candy she bought was M&Ms. So what we do is literally just come over here and we type in our answer. 8, don't forget the decimal. 39, 8.39, okay? All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go ahead and move on to question number 10. Now, I know question number 10 here says that we're doing calculator active. Um, if we were in class, I'd go ahead and pass you guys out a calculator, but I'm going to be real honest with you. Don't go around your house looking for a calculator right now. Okay, listen, so we've talked about this before. A lot of times on the check-in or the EOG, Yes, you will be given a calculator to answer the calculator active questions, but a lot of times you're not going to need a calculator. You're not even going to be able to use a calculator for some of those questions. This is where you're going to find questions where you have models like pictures or decimal grids. Uh, these are going to be questions where it might be, you know, like a geometry question, like after we learn about like squares and trapezoids and things like that. And guys, you can't use calculators to answer those questions. So that's why I don't even get excited when I see calculator active, because it doesn't necessarily mean that the test is about to get easier. Okay, so we're going to do this without a calculator. And I bet you guys are going to find that you can answer these questions without needing a calculator. We're going to be fine, okay? So what I want you to do is go ahead and start reading number 10 to yourself if you haven't already, and then I'll jump in and help you guys in a second. Okay. All right. Sorry, guys. I had to respond to a dojo message. All right. So here we go. We're on question number 10. A drinking glass holds one-fifth gallon of water. How many drinking glasses can be filled from six gallons of water? In all my years of fifth grade math, this has always been a question that thoroughly confuses 
my kids. So what I'm actually going to do here is kind of draw a little picture to help you guys. And you don't need to draw this. I just need you to watch. If we were in class together, I would actually be like pulling out like a giant jug of water and a cup. So you guys could kind of see me model this, but obviously we're not in class together. So I'm just going to kind of draw it out on paper. All right. So what do I have here? I have a drinking glass. So just like a little glass. This is my little glass of water. Okay. And it can hold one fifth gallon of water. That is the capacity. And this is not even a word that I need you to like write down or remember, you're not going to be tested on it. I mean, yeah, I try to remember it, but anyways, so the word is capacity. Capacity is kind of like volume, meaning that is how much the cup can hold. This cup can only hold one fifth gallon of water. And I have my water bottle here. Y'all see me carry this thing around with me everywhere, right? My giant black water bottle and the capacity of my water bottle is 32 ounces. I'm going to see if I can get the camera to show y'all that. I don't know if it'll work. No, y'all can't see it. Okay, so never mind. That's not going to work. But anyways, at the very bottom of my water bottle, it says 32 ounces, meaning that is the capacity of my water bottle. It can only hold 32 ounces of water. What happens when I try to put in more than 32 ounces? It overflows and makes a giant mess, right? So that's what I mean when I say capacity. And all water bottles have a capacity. If you go look in your fridge or maybe you have a water bottle right now, it has a capacity. That's how much liquid it can hold. Okay, so I'm moving on. All right, so now what else do I have in the word problem? It says how many drinking glasses can be filled from six gallons of water. So here's my drinking glass, but I also have six gallons of water. So here's gallon number one. Again, guys, you don't need to write this down. I just need you to pay attention because like I said, this, this is a tough problem. This is one that kids get wrong every year. Okay. So now what I have here are my six gallons of water. Okay. So I have a cup. My cup can only hold one fifth gallon of water. That's not even one whole gallon, right? That's less than a whole gallon. What do I have? What I also have are six whole gallons of water. Like if you look in your fridge, you have like a gallon of milk or a gallon of orange juice or apple juice or whatever, right? So we want to know how many drinking glasses can be filled from six gallons of water, meaning how many of these cups am I going to be able to completely fill up with water from these six gallons of water? So what am I going to do? I'm going to grab jug number one, gallon number one, and I'm going to pour some of that water into a cup, right? When I pour it into a cup, here's one cup. Well, that one cup can hold one fifth gallon of water, meaning I'm going to have some water left over in this gallon. So I pour another cup and then I pour another cup and another cup and another cup. I'm going to be able to give myself five cups. Why is that? Because if each cup holds one fifth, look, here's one fifth, two fifths, three fifths, four fifths, five fifths and five fifths is equal to a whole. So now I'm done. That, that one gallon of water is gone. He's gone. I'm going to throw that in the trash because I've already used it. So now I move on to my second gallon of water. And guess what? I do it all over again. I pour another cup of water and another and another and another and another. I just poured myself five cups of water because remember each cup can hold one fifth. So after I'm done, I move on from jug number two to jug number three, and I'm going to do this all over again. I'm going to do it with jug three, and then jug four, and then jug five, and then jug six. So I'm going to keep pouring myself water into these teeny tiny little glasses until I have no more gallons of water left over. So what did I split here? That, that's really what it comes down to, guys. What did I split? Did I split my one fifth cup of water or did I split my six gallons? Well, we've talked about this in class. If I split my one fifth cup, that's like if I hand you a glass of water in class and you just go crazy and you ninja chop that thing in half. I mean, does that make any sense? No, not only are you going to cut up your hand, you're also going to have a broken water glass that you can't even use to hold water anymore. 
right? So that doesn't make any sense. What makes sense here is to take the six gallons of water you have in the fridge and split those up split those up into teeny tiny little cups. So my total here that I'm splitting is actually this six gallons of water. And how am I splitting that up? I'm splitting it into one fifth sized parts. Why? Because that's the size of the cup that I'm pouring my water into. Okay. So now what I need you to write down with me on your study guide is this. We're taking six cups of water or six gallons that is our total that's our total you guys are doing great stay with me okay stay with me we're actually going to be finished up here pretty soon so stay with me okay so that is my total i'm going to split that into one fifth sized parts and you can even write size of cup because that's the reason why I'm splitting this into one-fifths. That's the size of the drinking glass that I have. So what you're doing here is six divided by one-fifth. So once you know that, all you have to do is solve it and get your answer and type that in the box, right? And now I'm kind of wishing I wouldn't have wrote so big, but it is what it is. All right, so now we're going to solve it. So how do we divide with a fraction? N divided by D or KFC? Hopefully you're thinking KFC, this is the strategy you use whenever you are dividing with a fraction. All right, so we're going to start with the letter K. Letter K means keep the first number the same, and I'm going to do it over here, guys, where I have some room. So 6, remember, that is the same thing as 6 over 1. 6 and 6 over 1, we're keeping them the same. So there goes the letter K. Now we're going to move on to the letter F. F means to flip the second number. So one over five, we're gonna flip that to five over one. There goes the letter F. And now the letter C, we're gonna change division to multiplication and we multiply straight across. So six times five is 30. One times one is one, we get 30 over one. So now this is where we have the conversation how do we type in our answer? Because we know that we can type in an improper fraction. Well, guys, we know that 30 over 1 is the same thing as what? What whole number is that equivalent to? It's equivalent to 30. So if I was you guys, I would not type in 30 slash 1. Because you know 30 over 1 is equivalent to 30, I would type in 30. You know 30 is just an easy whole number to type in. You don't have to worry about making sure you did your improper fraction correctly. Let's just type our answer in as 30, okay? All right, guys, we're going to move on to number 11. Um, and I tell you what, we're going to do 11, 12, 13, and then I will stop the video right there. And that's all you will have to do for Thursday, okay? All right, so we're going to do number 11 now. It says, Mason bought three items at a store. One item cost $8.26. Another item cost $27.54. The total cost of the three items was $64.57. So we want to know, what was the cost of the third item? Now, right here, oops, excuse Hannah. me. Yes? Hey, Amelia Yang's mom's here for something she was supposed to pick up from you. Can Amelia come down here and grab it? Sure, I'll just hand it down there. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank okay, you. Bye. Oh, sorry, guys. All right, so uh, right here, this little note always gets uh, kids confused. So I want to talk to you guys about what that is. All right, so right here, I'm going to highlight that so y'all can see exactly where I'm at. So it says, express the answer as dollars, decimal, cents. Literally, all that means is that in your answer, we're going to have a decimal, on the left side of your decimal, that number should represent dollar bills. And on the right side of your decimal, that should represent cents. Which, guys, you already know that. You know that that's how you write money. You write dollars, then a decimal, and then cents. So don't let that confuse you because that this is something you already know how to do. So we're not going to worry about that. All right, so let's solve the word problem together. All right, so the most obvious thing they gave us in the word problem was this last sentence. The total of the three items was $64.57. So write this down with me. Here's what that means. It means item, 
number one, write this down. Even if you think you already know how to do this, good for you. Write this anyways. Plus item number two, plus item number three. When we add all three items that she bought, what should that equal? That should equal $64.00. And 57 cents. So, do we know the cost of the first item? Yes, we do. It's right here, $8.26. So, I'm going to, hey, honey, come on in and just grab it out of your desk, okay? Because I'm recording a video. <laughs> I'm glad you caught that. <laughs> All right, guys. So, do we know the uh, cost of item number one? Yep, it's right here, $8.26. Do we know the cost of item number two? Yep, it's right here, the second item, $27.54. So I'm going to check that off. We know that information. Now, do we know the cost of item number three? No, we don't. This is what we're trying to figure out. Bye, honey. That's what we're trying to figure out because the question even says, what was the cost of the third item? So how do we figure out the cost of the third item? You should have already realized this is going to be a two-step word problem. So what's step number one? All right, so step number one. We're going to combine these two items and we're going to figure out what was the price of these two items combined. We're going to get a number. We're going to subtract that number from the total, which will be step number two, because that'll tell us how much money we had left over to use for the third item. Okay, so let's go ahead and do step number one together. So step number one, we're going to add the two items together that we already know the cost of. Now what you guys should do is put the number on top that has the most digits or put the bigger number on top. So that's 27.54. That was one item plus 826 for the second item. So we're just adding together those two items. Okay, go ahead and bring your decimal straight down. And guys, I know at the very beginning of January, we were learning how to like multiply decimals. That is not on your second NC check-in. That's the third NC check-in. So when you're adding and subtracting decimals, remember that decimal comes straight down. Don't ignore it. It comes straight down. Okay. All right. So we're going to add four and six is 10. So zero regroup of one. Uh, five and two is three or not three. Goodness, listen to me. Five and two is seven <laughs> plus one more. That's going to make eight. And then we know we can either do 27 plus eight or just seven plus eight. Um, I know seven plus eight is 15. So if I regroup a one and then one plus two is three. So that's $35 and 80 cents, but that's just for these two items. I'm gonna make my decimal a little bit bigger together. Now what I need to do is use this number in step number two. So I'm gonna do step number two. Step number two, this is gonna give me my answer. So I'm gonna take my total which is $64.57, okay? And then I'm going to subtract from that this answer right here that I got in step number one, the $35.80. I'm gonna subtract that because when I subtract that, that's telling me how much money I have left over to dedicate to the third item that Mason bought, okay? Go ahead and bring your decimal straight down. And then from here, guys, it's just basic subtraction. Can I do seven minus zero? Yes. So let's go ahead and do it. That would be a seven. Can I do five minus eight? No. We're going to cross off the five. Can I do four minus five? No. Can I do six minus three? Yes. So this is where we start the regrouping. So the six becomes a five, the four becomes a 14, 14 is now 13, the five becomes a 15 and stop. Don't cross off the seven, right? Cause we were able to subtract here. See, we were able to subtract here. So we just went ahead and did it. So now we got to subtract everything else. So we're going to do 15 minus eight, which is what? Seven, yep, seven. Uh, 13 minus 5, which is 8, and then 5 minus, let's see, what do we have here? 3, and 5 minus 3 would give us 2. So this is our answer. That's how much money he spent on the third item, $28.77. And while you guys are writing that in your box, I want to show you something here. So this is where, when you had a calculator, you could use it to check over your answer. So remember, 
I know that all three items, look right here, item number one, two, and three, I should be able to add them together to get 64.57. So I'm going to check my work using a calculator. So the cost of item number one, 826, plus item number two, 27.54, plus item number three, which we subtracted and said was 28.77. So I'm going to add 28.77. Now, when I hit enter, I have to get 64.57. If I don't, I got the wrong answer. So guys, on the calculator active, use your calculator to check your answer. I mean, this literally is taking me like five seconds. So I hit enter and looky there. 64.57. That means that I can move on to the next question and I am 100% confident that I got this right because I just checked it using a calculator. So I know without a doubt, hey, there's one question that I know I've got the right answer to. That's always a good feeling, right? Okay, so let's move on. We're going to do uh, questions number 12 and 13. They should be real easy. Um, you should see decimal grids right here. So for questions number 12 and 13, uh, this is how I actually taught you guys how to do decimals from the very beginning. Remember, you actually have a page in your notebook where I gave you grids and you wrote down what you saw as a fraction and then you converted it to a decimal. And for you guys, this was like the easiest thing in the world. So if it was easy back in December, it should be easy now in January, right? Maybe you just need a refresher. All right, so if you look at number 12, it says what amount of the grid below is shaded and you'll notice we have to type in our answer all right so the first thing you need to notice is this how many parts has my decimal grid there been divided into how many parts has that been divided into you should be saying a hundred okay it's a 10 by 10 array so that's your denominator now, we're going to count how many parts are shaded. If you count the rows going across, you can count by tens. So that's 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. So see, I'm at 50, but now I need to count down here by ones. So look, that's 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56. So what I have shaded in as a fraction is 56 hundredths. Now, every year my kids will ask me, can I just type in 56 slash 100 and get the right answer? And my honest answer to that is, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I don't know that the computer would count your answer correct. And I'll tell you why. Look right here. See this little... Thing right here where it says a square unit is equal to 0 0.01 since 0 0.01 is 100 but in a decimal form that tells me that the computer probably wants you to type in a decimal and not a fraction so every year what I tell my fifth graders is type this in as a decimal and then I can guarantee you that you will get the right answer on a check-in we don't want to play the what-if game we don't want to play, well, what if I type it in like this? Will I be good? That is not the day to start playing a guessing game, okay? So we know the answer is 56 hundredths. Now we're just going to write it as a decimal. So that should be easy, right? 0 0.56, and that is your answer that you're going to type into the box. So 0 0.56, type that in your box, and you are good to go. All right, guys, stay with me through number 13, and then I'll let you go off this video, okay? Number 13, it says each large square below has a value of 1. And then the question says, what is the total value of the shaded areas of the large squares? Well, we've done these as well, okay? But what you'll notice here this time is that we have two decimal grids. And what a lot of kids think that they need to do here is add them together. You could add these together, but you don't need to. You don't need to add them together. Instead, here's what you need to remember. Write this with me. We're about done, guys. Come on, stay strong. This video is shorter than your normal math class, okay? So you're used to sitting for a lot longer than this. Stay with me. You got it, okay? All right, so you have a decimal point here, right? What is written on the left side of the decimal? And please don't say numbers. Duh. Numbers are always written on the left side, but what do those numbers represent? These numbers are your 
whole numbers. Remember, these are your whole numbers, okay? Now, what goes on the right side of the decimal? This is going to be your fraction or your part of the whole. But since a fraction is a part of the whole, we will just write the word fraction, okay? That's what you need to remember for a question like this one. So when we go back up to the decimal grids, do we have a whole shaded in? Please say yes, because it's right there. <laughs> the answer is yes. Look, I'm pointing to it right here. That is one hole shaded in. Now, how many holes are shaded in? Just this one. So we're going to put a one as our whole number. Now look at the next decimal grid. Is the whole thing shaded in? No. What's shaded in here? Only part of the whole. Well, what do we call part of a whole? We call it a fraction. So this is going to be your fraction. So what is shaded in here? I see two bars that are shaded in. So that's my numerator. And then how many parts does this decimal grid have? It has 10. So in the second model, I see two tenths shaded in. Well, how do we show two tenths as a decimal? We put a two in the tenths place. And then guys, that's it. That's your answer. So literally all you would have to type in is 1.2. And then again, my kids will always ask me, can I put a zero after the two? Yes, you can. Because remember, that's not going to change the value. But why would you? There, there's no reason to. There's no reason why you would just decide to throw a zero in there. So even though you're not changing the value, that's not something that you need to do. So, so don't do it. Don't get extra. Don't get all fancy. Just leave it alone. Okay. So 1.2, type in 1.2 and then that's it. When I see you guys for the next video, we will start right here with number 14. Thank you guys. Um, remember your math homework is going to be due on Wednesday. If you have any questions, uh, your parents can dojo me or you can uh, reach out to me on Google Classroom. Uh, just be patient with us, guys. Your teachers right now, our phones are being blowed up with messages. And that's not a bad thing, okay? That just means that it might take us a little bit longer to get back to you guys. So if you're messaging me on Google Classroom, uh, just be patient with me and I'll get back to you guys as soon as I can, okay? I'll see you guys hopefully next week. Bye!